Um, but let's read Proverbs 14.34. The Word of God is read in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. And it says, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we, we get into the Word, like I said, we're going to go to Proverbs 14.34. And I just want to break those that, that Scripture in two different areas here. The first part, righteousness exalts the nation. Then it says, but sin also uh, is a reproach to any people, not just a nation. But if somebody were to ask you today, what makes a great nation? What answer would we give? You know, there's various opinions of what makes a great nation. Some of them is, uh, some would answer, they would say, well, what makes a great nation is a strong economy. Makes a strong nation. Some would say, well, political stability makes a great nation. Others would say good government. Some today would say uh, culturally diverse would make a great nation. Others lean on the side of social welfare. They say to a man, to have a great nation, you have to have social welfare. Others say, no, you have to be innovative and, and be creative to have a great nation. And last, some say you have to have international influence to have a great nation. But you notice in all of these that I just mentioned, None there is mentioned about God in order to be a great nation. What's often missing is the freedom to worship and honor God in all the aspects of a nation's life. And I think that this is so critical for us today in 2023. Some of us never thought we would live to see 2023. You remember the Y2K? I'm going to give my age here. I was 10 years old. And I was scared. I said, I'm never going to get married. I'm never going to have children. The world's going to end. I was 10 years old. And we're in 2023 now. And it's the same subject. What makes a great nation? We can have all of these that I just mentioned. But without God, an individual and a nation is nothing without God. You know, sometimes it's difficult to understand how people go about their daily lives without a relationship with God. With all the trouble that you and I have serving God, imagine if we didn't have God in those times of trouble where we would be today. Some of us would be in jail, and some of us would probably be buried like those outside there, without God. But in all of this, it's important to know that God is still actively involved in the affairs of nations. Did you know that? God is still judging the nations. He's still the judge of nations. He still has the authority to judge over them whether the nations are doing good or the nations are doing bad. God judges them. And He judges the nations according to His Word. Not according to what we think is a great nation. Now, throughout history, there have been numerous examples of nations that have faced judgment for their sins and rebellion against God. We've read them. The Old Testament records God's judgment on nations like Egypt. You remember that? Moses? Babylon? Assyria? You know, a while back when we were in the Middle East, we went to a, a, a city that is mentioned in the Bible where they hung after Saul, King Saul and his children. After he committed suicide, they grabbed his body and they hung him in that city as a... Uh, as a, a badge of honor to them because they had uh, defeated God's people. And the tour guide that was with us said, do you know how this city was destroyed? Do you know why it's in ruins? He said, no army came and destroyed it. There was no war that left everything in ruins. He said, this city was destroyed by an earthquake. And automatically it came to my mind and said, that was God's judgment. 
Because he is in charge and he's still judging the nations. Now I know that in a few days, a lot of people will be celebrating here in our country, in the United States, because I can only speak of the United States because I'm a citizen in this country. But here in our country, we'll be celebrating independence and some don't even understand that independence that they have. But what about our independence that we have in Jesus? What about that aspect that He's still judging the nations and judging individuals? God is still in the throne and He still is aware of what's going on today. Not just in the United States, but in every single country, God is aware and He puts and He removes kings in those nations. He's still sovereign. Now the Old Testament records this. Egypt, Babylon, Assyria, the wickedness of their idolatry. While the book of Revelation in the New Testament speaks of God's judgment to nations for their rebellion against Him and the mistreatment of His people. However, also the Bible teaches that we have a merciful God. How many of you know that? We have a gracious God. And that He desires that all people, all nations, turn to Him in repentance. That's the key. Repentance. It's not just coming up here and asking God to forgive your sins when you really don't have the conviction of repentance upon you of the life that you lived without God. Now, the Bible encourages us to seek God for forgiveness and then do what? Turn from our wicked ways. Every time that Jesus would heal somebody, He would say, go and do what? Sin no more. Turn from your wicked ways. And even on occasions, He would say, if you don't do it, it's going to get worse for you. And God is still speaking to nations today, and He's telling the nations today, through the church, and through the kingdom, and through His children, that we must turn back to God. We want to get things better, not just here and anywhere and, and, and in the world. Turn back to God. Now, we're all very familiar with the following verse. You've read this. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then he would do what? I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. It's the same God. It applies to us. We want healing in this land? What does it say? Turn from our wicked ways. Turn from self-dependence to dependence on God. When reading this scripture, it's important that we know that while it was originally directed towards the people of Israel, it also applies to God's children today. The promise is that if God's people remain humble, not just humble, but dependent on who? On Him. You look at my children, my children depend on me. And there's things that sometimes I don't want to do. Last night I was so tired. I was sitting down there, I was tired. And my daughter says, Dad, I need something. I left it in the car. My wife is tired. She's in bed. She's like, you go get it. <laughs> and I can say no and don't, but you know what? That child depends on me. She not only depends on me, but she depends on my protection. So, guess what I did? I had to get up. I said, I got to do the father thing. I had to go all the way out there late at night, get what she needed. Came, and when I gave it to her, she was so happy. She said, Thank you, Dad. Now, think about God. How when we can depend on Him, God will never fail us. He may not answer at the moment we need Him to answer because He knows why He's not going to answer at that moment. But think about everything you've gone through in your life. And think about all the things you've been through. You know, sometimes it just hits me and I go, oh, now I understand. Why years ago I had to go through all this? And then you begin to piece a puzzle in your life and you say, that's why God didn't permit for me to have that because he knew that this was going to happen. And then you say, wow, God is in charge, even though sometimes I don't hear him. 
Sometimes I don't understand him, but God is in charge. Why? Because we depend on him. Now, what if a nation and the president of a nation and the people of a nation would turn to God in that same very way? We see great things happen in this nation. We see what people are praying for. Yesterday, I was speaking to a man. He was in his 80s. And one of the things that surprised me was that I was told that he said he wanted to go into the ministry. 80-something years old. He'd been an accountant almost all his life. And I said, well, what do you want to do? He said, I just feel that God wants me to pray for people. And I said, well, what are you going to do? He's selling his house. I said, what are you going to do? He said, well, I'm moving to Louisiana or Baton Rouge around there. And I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, I want to go to Jimmy Swagger's church. You remember old Jimmy Swagger? He, he wanted to cut up with the Pentecostals over there in that area. But he, what, what, what was astounding to me, he's 80-something years old, and his desire is to do what? Serve God. It's never too late. His desire was to be dependent on who? On God. And I said, I wish you the best, I said, that God would use you, that when you get down there, God would His desire, he said, I want to go into the ministry. 80-something years old. Now, it's important to remember that when God tells him, if my people would turn from their evil ways, if they would humble themselves, God was giving, he was speaking to King Solomon during a time of great prosperity. They had just dedicated the tabernacle. Things were going well. The power of God came down in that tabernacle. The Bible says that the priest, it, it, the, 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 the Shekinah glory, the, the cloud of glory was so thick in that place. They couldn't even see each other, but they were worshiping God in that place. And then God says to them, but if you humble yourself, I'll do something great. He knew that the time was going to come where they were going to turn their backs on him. They were going to be enslaved by the Babylonians. They were going to be taken away. But God said, even when you're in Babylon, if you humble yourself and pray, I'll bring you back to Zion. And you remember the occasion where they're in Babylon and they tell the, the Jews, they say, sing us the songs of, of, of Zion. They say, how are we going to sing the songs of Zion in a strange land? But they had to remember that God has spoken to them that if they as a nation, as a people, as individuals would humble themselves, He would heal their land. He would bring them back to where they were in the beginning. That should be a lesson for us today. Not just individually, not just in the church, but in this nation today. And we need a, a men and women to stand up in this nation and be willing to give their lives for this message. That's the only way we're going to get a great awakening again. Do we need a great awakening? Oh, we need a great shakening. That's what we need. We need God to come and shake us. Yeah. And get our attention. This is said that in, in, in the, um, before the Great Awakening, in these early days, they began to pray. That's the first thing they did, begin to pray. And call prayer meetings. And all they did was pray. And pray. And then pray some more. Until God answered. And we look at the scripture here, and God reminds them, and he tells them, hey, I know the future. I know this is all beautiful. I know you've dedicated this temple, but all this ain't worth nothing if you turn your back on me. And we can have the, the greatest temple, the biggest international offices, the, the greatest tabernacle, but if God is not in the place, it ain't worth nothing to us. And what brought revival to this nation was these old brush harbors. Do you remember those? People would get together and God's power would fall in this little place, look like a little shack, didn't have no walls, didn't have nothing in there. But God's power was in that place because they humbled themselves and they depended on God. And we ask ourselves today, why are many nations in the way they are today? Because they've turned their backs on God. God. But you know what? God is still merciful to the United States. He's still merciful because there's still a small remnant 
that wants to depend on God. That's why we haven't seen total destruction. That's why God has been merciful to us. And guess what happened? The Israelites, after all of this, felt entitled and they all were God's people. Hey, nothing going to stop us. We can, we can sin all we want, but His promise is still on us. It don't work that way. We can say all day, oh, we're the church of God. And do whatever we want and think that we're going to continue to be God's church. It don't work that way. And they turned their backs on God. And they suffered the consequences. But if only they had would, or they would have remained faithful to God and followed His commandments, they would have had His blessings and His protection. Moses, a prophet in the Bible, a man of God, warned the Israelites of their consequences of disobeying God. In Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68, when you get a chance, read that. Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68. Moses, he gave them an outline, a list of things that would happen to Israel if they failed to follow God's commands. Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68. What did these curses include? They would suffer famine. Now that's physical famine that Israel would suffer. Do you believe we have a spiritual famine today? Oh, yeah. We have a spiritual famine today. It's sad to see the situation in many areas filled, places called uh, uh, places of worship. And the people come hungry and they leave hungry. There's a famine today of the Word of God. And if this man that I was speaking to is 80-something years old, he has a desire to go into the ministry, that should wake us up also. And say it's never too late to serve God. To do, what, I said, what do you want to do? He didn't want to be a preacher. He didn't want to. He didn't want to be a teacher. He said, I just want to pray for people. You and I can pray for people. What a desire! He said, look, if you don't follow God, Moses said, these curses will come upon you: famine, disease, military defeat. You know, it's so sad today. And I just talk about our country to see the state of our military also. It's tough. It said here, famine, disease, military defeat, and even exile from their land. And the passage serves as a warning to the Israelites of the severe consequences that come with disobedience and emphasizes the importance of following God's commands. Now, Proverbs 14.34. Go with me there where we started. The first half of that scripture, Proverbs 14, 34, says, Righteousness exalteth a nation. That word righteous is a fundamental attribute of God. It's one of the characteristics of God, that God is righteous. He is. It's essentially part of His nature. Being perfectly righteous, God always acts in accordance with what is right and just. So His actions are based on His holy and perfect nature. So what is it saying here? That we are called as individuals, as a nation, to model our lives after who? God's righteousness. This only involves striving to live in a way, listen, that aligns God's standards and ours. It aligns with God's standards of what is right and what is wrong. It achieve, and to achieve this, how do we do it? By studying the Bible, by reading, by fasting, by getting into God's Word and understanding God's will for our lives and to pray that He would guide us and strengthen us in our walk with Him. We all need God's help. Amen? We all need it. To practically model after God's righteousness, because it says, righteousness exalted a nation, we should live lives of integrity. There are still men and women that are men and women of integrity. Did you know that? There's still some around. There's still some men and women that are honest. Don't lose faith on humanity. There's still people that are honest. 
There are still people in this world that are just. And this means treating others with respect and compassion even in difficult situations. It also means making choices that reflect God's standards even when it goes against popular opinion. And we're going to get closer to that. The closer we're getting to the coming of Christ, the more you're going to see that the choices that you and I are making to follow God are unpopular with this world. And what does that tell you? That the nation slowly is doing what? Giving its back to God. God help us. I just imagine Lady Liberty giving her back and somebody coming and pushing her back to the front and saying, no, 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 don't give your back on God. Stay focused on God. Stay on the way. Don't leave the way. Stay on God. It depends on us. Now, it says here that we are to avoid sin in anything that goes against God's standards. Now, righteousness exalted a nation. Now, the word exalted. Why would the writer of Proverbs use this word exalted? Because we see a lot of puffed up people today, right? They see a lot of that going on. Hmm? The writer suggests that a nation that turns to God and models after his righteousness will experience exaltation. They'll be exalted. That's the, the Hebrew word there means that they'll be lifted up. So he's saying, hey, if a nation has the characteristics and the attributes of the just God, of the just righteousness of God, then that nation will be lifted up. To who? To God. And the term here signifies not only lift it up, but it signifies the power that exists or will exist in that nation when they're righteous. However, it's important to remember that lifting up is not self-glorification. But to draw attention to who? To God. Huh? We don't get up here, or the preacher shouldn't get up there to talk about and exalt himself. His whole thing is to who? Lift up Jesus and glorify Him and have Him receive all the glory. Part of the five solas of the, of the Protestant Reformation, we had solus scriptura, you had solus Christo, solus faith, but one of them was soli Deo Gloria, which meant only God deserves the glory. And they knew that the basis of what they were doing at the end glorified God. And what do we observe today? The exaltation of man over God happening all around us. Even in the Christian world today. People becoming increasingly prideful in their sin. We see that everywhere today. People seeking the glory for themselves instead of God. God, he needs to, God needs to help us. Hmm? That this, this spirit that is out there today that is wanting to exalt all themselves do, does not creep into the church. And at the moment we see it creep in, we rebuke it and leave it out of the church. So that in the church we'll have men and women leadership that is uh, men and women of integrity, honest and just and righteous in God's eyes. And you know what will happen then? God will exalt the church, not to be puffed up, but what will, it ha what will happen? Listen to what Jesus said in John 12, 32. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Now, yes, I understand that the interpretation here, he's talking about Calvary, he's getting lifted up. But listen to what he's saying. He said, if I be lifted up, so if I exalt Christ, I, he will draw all men. So what is our job in the church of God? To exalt Jesus, to glorify Jesus, to honor Jesus, and as we do it, He will fulfill His part and He will draw all men unto Him. He'll bring Him in. But we have to exalt Him. So what is the saying here? Righteousness exalted a nation. So in other words, a nation that put God first will be exalted. Why do you think the pilgrims came to this country? Why do you think they were willing to give their lives? Why do you think God, before they came, allowed a Native American by the name of Squanto to be taken as a slave back to England? 
He didn't know no English. And when he got there, he was sold to a man who said, I'm going to teach this Native American English. And he learned English. And when he learned English, what did Squanto say? He said, I want to go back to my country. And he came back here, and he came before the pilgrims. So when the pilgrims are dying and they don't know what to do, all of a sudden a Native American comes up and he says, hello. Well, I don't know if he said hello that way, but he said, he said something that they, they said, how in the world does this Native American understand English? It was God's will for him to be taken a slave and learn and come back. It, you know what? If, he wouldn't, if that wouldn't have happened, we, we wouldn't be here today. Because he taught them and he, and he showed them how to survive. Because he knew the language. Now, I don't know if it's true or not, but it is said that before Squanto died, he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Because the pilgrims, many of them being Puritans, brought over. And you know what? You'll be surprised. They didn't bring the King James Bible. They brought the Geneva Bible. <laughs> Only one had the King James. Everybody else had the Geneva. Nobody wanted to do nothing with King James. They said, his Bible, we, ain't got no, we don't want nothing because we're running away from James. So they brought the Geneva Bible. And get, but guess what? They brought God's word. And that nation was established on what? Dependence on God. That's our roots. And you can try to erase everything you want. You can try to take it away from your mind. But there's no erasing that history. That's what we were based on, the dependence of God as a nation. That's it. You, you can't take that away. I was born in Belize. You can't take that away from me. I'm Belizean, but I'm a United States citizen. But I can't erase that history. I can't. It's a part of my DNA. It's a part of who I am. And that's a part of who we are here in this country. It's part of our DNA, the founding of this country. I'm not saying that all of them were perfect. All, no, it's, men had problems. Yeah, they, you know, you look at Thomas Jefferson's Bible. They call it a Bible and you open it up and it has all these different holes in it where he cut off all the miracles of Jesus. And he only kept the morals of Jesus. And I told somebody at the Museum of the Bible, I said, well, that, that ain't no Bible. That's a moral of Jesus book. I never seen a body say, what got in there? A mouse or something? It's all cut up. But, and, and then it's called the morals of Jesus. Not a Bible, but they call it the Thomas Jefferson Bible. He wasn't a perfect man, but guess what? There was men that decided that we're going to found this nation on dependence of God. So righteousness exalted a nation. It doesn't mean that that nation is going to exalt them. No, they're going to exalt Christ. They're going to exalt God. And then what does the next part of the scripture say? But sin is a reproach to who? To any people. Notice, it didn't say to just the nation of Israel. It said to any people, not just the Jews, but also the Gentiles. So in other words, this universal law of God applies to everyone. And not just a certain nation. It refers to any action, any thought, any attitude that goes against the will of God. It is a destructive force that corrupts and undermines the foundation of a society. That's what sin does to a society. When sin becomes pervasive in a nation, the consequences are far-reaching. It leads to, listen to me, does this sound like the news today? It leads to moral decay, social unrest, and the last one, economical instability. We see it everywhere. What is the cause of it? Sin. I'm not pointing out just one sin. I'm talking about the whole thing. And the very fabric of society, what begins to happen? It begins to unravel and the nation's reputation suffers as a result. In contrast to the exaltation that comes with righteousness, sin brings the same reproach upon a people. And it is shameful when an individual or a nation turns their back on God. It's shameful. Self-dependence is a sin when it comes to this. Particularly for a nation. And nowadays, we are witnessing an increasing number of nations falling into apostasy. This includes not only countries, but also churches. We, we were in Israel. And we were in, in Tel Aviv. 
And I said, well, they're not celebrating Shabbat in Tel Aviv. They said, no. He said, we're the most secular nation when it comes to Tel Aviv and all the world. First country or first city in the world to accept gay marriage, Tel Aviv. The number one capital of the world for this sin. Not the only sin, because the liar that dies without Christ and is a liar will go to hell just like a homosexual. But what I'm telling you is that we begin to see this all around us, apostasy. It includes not only countries, but also churches that are falling into apostasy today. We're living in apostasy. <laughs> you look at it, you say, Lord, this is where we're living in. More and more we're seeing individuals and churches falling away from their commitment to honor God in everything. The consequences of self-dependence and self-exaltation inevitably will lead to a downfall. And therefore, it is crucial for you and I to remain in the protection of God's church, to strive towards the goal of glorifying God and fulfilling His will. And now throughout history, we have read of great nation and empires that grew in great numbers. But what happened? Where are they now? Where is the Roman Empire today? In ruins. Where are the great empires? Where is the, the great Babylonian Empire with the great Babylonian gardens? Where is it at today? It's in ruins. You know, there's a prophecy that said that nothing would be built outside of those city walls of Babylon. You go today, and archaeologists can tell you, outside of these walls, ain't nothing being built. And what's inside these walls? Wild animals, hyenas. And if you go to the Scripture, the Bible says that there will be wild animals and hyenas in that place. Exactly what the Bible says. Exactly. So where are these nations? There's a wonderful song here. I want to read this to you, the lyrics to this song, and we'll finish with this. It said, the spotlight is on today's icons. Is that true? But in a thousand years, nobody will care. Their light's gone. But at the same time, Christ will still shine bright. He's not the limelight. He is the limelight. Now, what does limelight refer to? It refers to the light that was once used in theater production consisting of a flame directed towards a cylinder, and it produced white light. So what is it saying? That Christ, in a thousand years, everybody else will be gone. Though you'll forget about it. They, they won't even know who Nathan Bonilla is, but who will be exalted still? Christ. He continues to say Plato is dead. Socrates is dead. Aristotle and Immanuel Kant are dead. Darwin is dead. However, Jesus is alive. He says Buddha is dead. Muhammad is dead. Gandhi and Hali Salasian are dead. Elijah Muhammad is dead. However, Jesus is alive. Nero is dead. Constantine is dead. Genghis Khan is dead. Attila the Hun are dead. Alexander the Great is dead. However, Jesus is alive. Napoleon is dead. Che Guevara is dead. Henry VIII is dead. Saddam Hussein is dead. However, Jesus is alive. And that professor from Nashville, in his debate with the rabbi, said, I understand all you're saying, rabbi, but you haven't been able to explain to me why the resurrection is true. Why you can't find his body in that tomb. And you know what happened? The rabbi could not explain it. He tried all he could, but he couldn't. So the choice is before us. Will we live righteous for God? Or will we suffer the consequences? God help our nation. Amen? Pray for our nation. Pray for our president. Pray for all those that are, have been called to govern. And I'm, just, I'm talking about our nation because this is the United States. I know people hear us outside of the country. 
But this is the, this is the country that we are in right now. They asked the president one time, well, why are you so concerned about the United States? He said, well, I'm the president of the United States. What do you expect? I got to take care of my people. It's not that he's trying to be mean or anything, but that's the, that he's a, he was chosen to take care of his people. And God has chosen to take care of us when we glorify him. Amen. I want you to rise with us.